Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the joint meeting of the Select Board, School Committee, and Finance Committee. It's October 29, 2018, and I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Tonight's meeting is a single topic meeting and it's a review of or forecast of our fiscal year 2020 budget. It's a budget that we're going to start preparing uh, in just a, a six weeks or so that goes into effect next July 1st. And so we've asked our chief financial officer and the, and the assistant superintendent for uh, business services for school to uh, talk to us and give the joint committees a uh, a review of, of what our budget prospects look like now about six to eight months in advance of the uh, of the meeting. There are a couple empty seats. I invite people from the Finance Committee want to come up here and see if you, if you don't mind. There's a couple of seats that people may or may not be at. More, more than one. Thanks. Uh, sure they can trouble. leave earlier that night. <laughs> don't worry about it. Okay. okay, so I'm, uh, I don't know, Beth, if you have any comments or Paul Santanello, who's the chair of the Finance Committee, you have any comments? Yeah. I do not. Okay, Paul? No, Paul, Paul Pesterzik, we're going to turn it over to you. Okay, first of all, I have a couple of hard copies if anybody needs a hard copy of this information. Thanks, Paul. You got extra spot right by me. I didn't know you had enough. Sorry. No, he's the one too. No, he's invisible. Thank you. starting out here? I am. I'm just trying to come up on the screen. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll basically start. Uh, since people have it in front of them anyway, it's more for the audience on TV land here, and then we'll not be able to see it. Um, you'll find that the numbers are very similar to years past, that we are starting off the fiscal year budget projection with a negative so-called half a million dollars by the time we you know, get to those numbers. What I'd first like to do is just go over a few things when it comes to Proposition 2.5, just to remind folks of, of, of how that works and kind of where we are looking up in, into the future. Um, the two major components of Proposition 2.5 is no more than a 2.5% a in, increase in the levy limit is allowed each year. But more importantly, and what we're being confronted with in the near future, is that the levy limit cannot be greater than the levy ceiling, and that levy ceiling equals 2.5% of the valuation. Um, our valuation has, has not grown over the last couple of years by more than 2.5%, two, two so we've been losing ground, and we'll just get into a projection of where we stand with that estimate of potentially when we could hit that um, projected ceiling if we do not have, if we do not have, um, any type of valuation growth. <clears throat> just very quickly, I just want to um, just go over the FY19 estimates at this point in time um, and the calculations of Proposition 2.5. Basically, we're just taking the levy limit has moved up the prior year levy limit. It's multiplied by two and a half percent, and to that number, new growth is added. Um, any operating overrides would be added, and we come up with our, our levy limit for the year. Our estimated exclusions, our debt exclusions for FY 2019, uh, amount to a little over 4.3 million dollars, almost 4.4. 
The biggest component of that is this building that we're in right now, the high school, and we will also be getting into the second year of, uh, I'm sorry, our first year of funding the new DPW facility that we've just began to build. Um, I am projecting a tax rate of over $25. I just want to make that clear. Um, people have always heard Proposition 2.5, and, and the tax rate cannot be over $25. But the, the, what cannot go over $25 is the tax rate when it's applied to the levy limit. Uh, we are allowed to add the exclusions, which is going to add basically another $2.10 to the tax rate. Um, so expected tax rate of somewhere over $25. I think it'll be a little bit below that because we did not fully raise to the levy limit and this number reflects, uh, I believe, a full addition there. So we're going to be in that vicinity for our tax rate for FY 2019. Um, FY 2020, if all that follows through, um, I did some projections with some base, basically the same assumptions that I'm using for, for our, that we'll get into a little bit later, but we would have a, a tax rate of nearly $26 if we move that one year forward. Excess capacity, it is very, very seldom that we have excess capacity. The town has always raised to the fullest amount that we could. Uh, and you can see some of the years over the six out of the last 36 years, we had certain amounts of money, considerable, in some cases, considerable amounts of money that were not up to the levy limit. Um, that one amount is 1997. Uh, FY 2016 was the last year we did not raise to the levy limit. Uh, that amount was $42,000. And it's anticipated that in FY 19, the current fiscal year, we will also not raise to the levy limit. We'll be about, I believe it's about $137,000 shy of that. So we'll be adding that to next year, uh, next year's uh, presentation. Um, I've also get, just given you a history of some of the values and our assessed values, um, and if one looks at these assessed values, even though FY19 is estimated, um, I will have that number in a couple of weeks. You can kind of see that we have been very stagnant. Um, I actually, we peaked out probably in maybe FY2009, where we had a, a valuation of $2.168 million. Right now, we're estimating the valuation to be about 2.1. That's where we're kind of getting in trouble with the proposition two and a half levy ceiling being $25, <coughs> is we do not have that, that valuation that's increasing, um, hopefully like it should be. I do anticipate that the valuation will increase, even though here it's only showing a modest increase for FY19 estimate. Um, I do anticipate that it is going to be a bit higher than that number. Paul, when do you want to take questions? While you're doing this, or it, it does, I'll take them now, yeah. When's our next? Formal evaluation, revaluation. FY19 is uh, the formal revaluation. So the two million or two billion ninety million that you had up there, that's prior to that revaluation. That 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 right there is just an estimate, and that estimate is based upon the FY18 amount plus one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of new growth. Again, I think once the once the revaluation is done, I think that number is going to come in higher. Um, because I think the values are going to go up something I, I that this actually portrays a zero percent valuation increase so I'm anticipating that there is going to be some type of valuation increase that will be reflected in that final number um, the DOR is I believe scheduled to meet with the assessors this coming Friday next Monday and next Tuesday um, so a lot of this information should be available shortly after those meetings take place <coughs> Very quickly, again, um, I'm trying to anticipate when we may hit that levy ceiling. Um, if we look at FY19, I have that, I have the numbers um, that I put in from earlier. Um, using, actually, again, no valuation increase, but only increases from new growth. In this projection here, I would anticipate that we would hit the levy ceiling in FY 2023. And again, that includes no valuation increases. 23 or 25? 23 on the, on the first number. The number below that, if we go down, does take into consideration a 
valuation increase above and beyond what the new growth is. If that 1% holds true for the foreseeable future, the next five or six years, we would be able to put that off to 2025. That's the difference between the two, Rich. The top okay. number has no valuation increase. The bottom number has a simple 1% valuation increase. Yeah, I was focusing on the bottom line. Right. So quickly, I just wanted to go and give you that number. Uh, as far as new growth is concerned, just want to give some historical perspective. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's, it's somewhat volatile. Um, we're usually in about the $200,000 range if we, if we took an average of all these years. Um, you know, the 10-year average of what we have here is $207,000. Uh, the low point, um, a little less than 150. I, right now, have a conservative number built in for FY19. It is only $150,000. So I would expect that there would be some wiggle room once that number is finalized in the next couple of weeks. I am also using $150,000 in the portrayal of future estimates, only to be on the conservative side. Did that include the long metal shops? The long metal shops is included, yes. And I believe that was included in FY18. Uh, I believe that was about seventy or eighty thousand dollars by itself. <clears throat> so, go ahead, Richard. Are we? Uh, if you could reel back four or five years ago, do you have any information? Are we on track with the same projections that you were making at that point, or are we in better shape or worse shape? Do you have that information, Paul? I'm going to say that we're in better shape because if we went back four or five years ago, I would probably have us in deficit by two million dollars. Because again, we've always had that five hundred thousand dollar figure. Um, we've we've tweaked the assumptions, um, made them a little bit less conservative, um, and we've had some good things happen. But again, I'm using very conservative numbers for the most part, and we would be in better shape than we were if those projections were looked at today. Is that in reference to the levy limit? Uh, that's in reference to the overall budget. Okay. Can you, can you clarify what do you mean in better shape by the budget when you say Well, again, if we, went, if we went back four years ago, let's say we went back to FY 2014, and we were looking at a projection for FY 19, that that projection for FY 19 would show that we would be a deficit of $2 million, as opposed to the half a million dollars that I'm showing now. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, the state aid came in very generous for the town of Longmeadow last year. Um, instead of a 2% increase, which had been forecasted, the increase was closer to 8%. Um, new growth, as I said, um, I've always put in $150,000. You saw the trend, the average is about two hundred and seven. So those types of things have, have put us in a better position than what I had projected years ago. Okay. Yes, Mary. You mentioned when you're looking at the 1% valuation. What have we seen the past few years averaging out? We have seen fluctuation. Um, two years ago, the value, or yeah, a couple of years ago, the valuations went up 6.32 percent for FY 2017. Last year, they declined by a quarter of a percent. Um, again, they're all on the levies and values on that tab there. But again, if you go back, I mean, the history is here, and this average is probably not all that great. Uh, One percent is probably kind of being generous if we took the average of these numbers going back to 2007 because we have 0 0.02, 0 0.45, 2.29, negative 3.88, 0 0.84, 0 0.02, positive 3.18, negative 4.13, positive 0.31, 0.39, 6.32, negative 0.24. So that 1% would probably would be a rough average, I would say, if we put all those numbers together. Might even be a little bit aggressive. Thank you. you know, Mark, she was, oh. I just Sorry, want to ask, um, how often is the revaluation re done? The revaluations are done every five years. There's a formal a formal sales analysis revaluation that is done with the Department of Revenue. And every year they do look at sales analysis, and by they I mean the Board of Assessors, and that has to pass muster at the Department of Revenue. But there's a requirement of every five years of a more formal revaluation. And then every nine years, there's what's known as a measure and list, where they physically go out and do an inspection um, of the residential, of, of all the properties. Um, you know, hopefully getting into the resident's home, looking to see the condition, if there's any improvements, um, new baths, additional bedrooms, or whatever's going on there. Um, that next one would be 2024. 
We're hoping to build that in as we just hired a consultant for the principal assessor's job. We're hoping to build that in as we go and do it instead of all getting done in 2024. We're hoping to get that done in the foreseeable years so we kind of catch all that new additions and things that people do not take out building permits for is the prime reason. We're hoping to catch all that so by 2024, we can go to the Department of Revenue and say, here's all our data, we kind of did this. Let's not go through the formality again, hopefully get it approved, so. Um, next, I've kind of just put together the text of what I've used as the budget assumptions before we before we um, get into the actual numeric presentation, we just want to go over what those assumptions were. And basically, we're talking about mainly the general fund. Um, the property taxes are estimated at this point in time to go up to the fullest extent allowed by Proposition 2.5, and, and that's the 2.5% increase. And then later on, when we go through the numerics, I adjust them downward for a goal of the select board and the um, town manager to only use. 2% of that 2.5%. And that half a percent roughly means about a quarter of a million dollars, $240,000. Um, but when I originally do the numbers, I use the full amount, and again, I back that out later. Um, an estimated amount for state aid increase, uh, 2%, $131,000. That number has historically hold relatively true with the exception of last year. Um, last year, as I said, um, was a, a grand year for Long Meadow in getting state aid revenue. We got closer to 8%. Um, we were very lucky. Uh, some of the calculations were, re were modified and updated. Um, and that's kind of basically what bailed us out last year, where we had that half a million dollar projection a year ago, roughly half a million dollar deficit projection. Um, local receipts, again, I'm estimating those to be 2%. Um, I just want to point out that there are certain local receipts that are earmarked that I would back those out, and those being the daycare revenues, which uh, are basically a reimbursement to pay for the daycare teachers directly, and costs associated with the ambulance, which again, um, would go directly towards the completion of the ambulance service and the purchase of the new ambulance at the time that is needed. Um, the current projections also have no reserves that are being used in the FY20 um, projections at this point in time. On the uses side, uh, I'm looking that we have um, basically level service, um, no, no changes in full-time equivalencies, um, a 3% increase to cover a cost of living increase, step increases, and, and attrition. Um, we've tracked that, and that's roughly have come out to about 3% over the last number of years. Um, when I apply that to all the town salaries, it's a little over a million dollars. I put in this year a, a half a percent to cover cost of ancillary cost to uh, uh, the expense line items. <coughs> that amounts to a uh, about a forty-six thousand dollar increase. Employee benefits um, I'm anticipating to go up about seven and a half percent, and that is exclusive of the amount that we're paying into the OPEB trust fund. Um, and that would be uh, seven hundred and six thousand dollars. Debt service I have a minor decline. Um, it's basically going down because of the refinancing that we did um, on the high school uh, a year ago or so um, that drastically dropped the interest amount payments, uh, the interest payments that we have going on. Uh, so that is actually an actual number that I have in there. The select board policy calls for a 1.25% uh, a amount of uh, the estimated tax levy to go into the OPEB trust fund. Um, that total is, I believe it's about $619,000, but it would be an increase of $124,000 from the current year. And the capital contribution at 3.25% of the net general fund revenues. Um, and that would amount to a capital uh, budget going into 2020 of just under $2 million. When I put this to a numeric perspective,
we're basically showing in the FY 2020 budget column. Um, all those numbers, like I said, put into numerics. Um, I'm going up to the 2.5% when it comes to property taxes, 2% increase in state aid, 2% increase in local receipts. Moving that down, basically a 3% amount on all the salaries in the functions of the town government, general government, public safety, <coughs> uh, planning, community development. All this is in, in the latter uh, pages two and page three of this report. Um, inclusive and then uh, we have getting into employee benefits and debt service the debt service is an actual number the employee benefits going up to ten million dollars and that's all funds and then as I stroll down and we make that comparison Again, we have the capital number of one seven one million seven one million nine hundred seventy five thousand going into capital, but the overall excess deficiency would be four hundred and twelve thousand dollars. And again, as I said, I would be backing out that half a percent, which is a, a goal of the select board and um, town manager to only use two percent of the two and a half percent. That equates to about two hundred forty thousand dollars. Projection being six hundred and fifty three thousand dollars in the hole at this point in time if we look if all these numbers held true um, again if you just scroll down on the information that you have all this back information is just detail of that first page again here you have the different departments with three percent increases in salaries uh, half a percent increase in in other expenses and in employee benefits so on and so forth Anybody have any questions for Paul at this point? So Paul, you you just want to reiterate, you're saying for six, about six hundred and fifty-three thousand dollars of a projected FY twenty deficit, which part of which is two hundred forty thousand dollars of unused levy capacity. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, finally, again, I've kind of summarized all the numbers that I was projecting and there's a slight difference between the left hand and right hand column but very quickly we have the the incremental additional general fund sources of one million five thirty eight seven ninety and then basically what I'm doing here is I'm backing out all those non-discretionary types of items that we basically are going to have to pay for no matter what that being the health insurance the pension assessment liability insurance so-called other employee benefits and then I put the the, uh, the change in the uh, um, the debt service. I don't know if this is the right actually if it's the right form. Yeah. Anyway, from there I just define those as as uh, non discretionary. We're not going to have a choice. We're going to have to fund those. That leaves us, in essence, on this column nine hundred and fifty five thousand dollars in so called discretionary funding. Um, projection on salary or projection on the capital increase that to go up two hundred thousand dollars the OPEB contribution 138 um, wages for the school department going up by the three percent wages for the town going up so on and so forth some other the general expenses would leave us back to that 414 I know I had 400 I believe 412 in the other location um, little rounding and then if we just take this one step further there's some calculations on if we were to di distribute that 400 and I'm sorry the 955,000 of discretionary funding we just have a calculation here where I take out debt service I take out the employee benefits those dis those non-discretionary types of of, uh, of, uh, of appropriations leaving the school and non-school budgets applying a percentage to those over here and then if I distributed that nine hundred fifty five thousand dollars according to those um, the nine hundred fifty five thousand dollars according to the percentages that are left over in the budget how we would kind of allocate that if we did it on this basis allocate that to the schools or the non schools the six hundred and sixteen thousand dollars comes uh, from the left hand I'm sorry the right hand column 
And the big di difference is how we treat, where we treat the capital and the OPEB contributions, whether they're non-discretionary or discretionary. But those would be the two differences in the column. And that's why, again, on the bottom, I, I show how we would allocate those according to those two calculations. That is what I have to present, so I'm <laughs> probably a lot to digest if you're not familiar with it. So, but. so Paul, with a, with a minimum projection at this point of $400,000 and a maximum projection of $650,000, or maybe that's not maximum, maybe that's a, you know, whatever you call the conservative or expected <coughs> deficit. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between four, 400 and 650. The question is, what are the opportunities to mitigate that that deficit I mean clearly state revenue could go higher tax you know you know, look at motor vehicle excise taxes could get could be higher than projected what are some of the other um, right now interest rates are rising um, so we will we will probably be able to increase to some degree the uh, interest revenue forecast although it has not been a huge number when it comes to all this um, that's one. Again, I would keep my fingers crossed on state aid. Um, I'm anticipating and hoping for something greater than $150,000 when it comes to new growth. Um, and if that happens in the FY19 new growth, that would then carry forward into FY2020. Um, the FY20 new growth, um, you know, Big Y has just done a major, doing a major expansion. I'm not quite sure how that's going to change the value, but that's a very positive number. I think I've mentioned to the select board with the district improvement financing, once that building gets up and running um, and the projected value is somewhat higher than we had originally projected, I would anticipate there's going to be excess funds, uh, $30,000, $50,000 that might be, uh, that could be able to go into the general fund as opposed to after we take care of the uh, district improvement financing debt service a couple areas um you know i keep my fingers crossed all the time on, on employee benefits uh just never know there where it's going to go um you know again i i I'm, I'm not counting on motor vehicle excise tax as much as i was in the past i, I think that has leveled off i think the biggest increase in the, in the most easily predicted the amount to go higher will be the interest revenue we will get a fairly good amount but it will go into free cash i don't want to use it in the estimates but we are earning interest on the bond proceeds for the uh um for the dpw um one month's worth of interest was about twenty three thousand dollars now that will decline as our cash flow goes down but that will certainly enhance our free cash at the end of this fiscal year to a point, not that we're going to use it, but we potentially would have a pretty good enhancement there, um, you know, from for our reserve position per se. Thanks. Anybody else have any other Paul? Paul, historically, in the, in the last 10 years, as you do these types of rollouts of the budget, how many times have there been a deficit of a half a million or more projected at these initial Just rollouts? Just about every year. Okay. <laughs> And what's the difference between this year and any other year, or is there, is that you see it? Um, I think one of the biggest differences, I think the collective bargaining agreements are being signed at a lesser cost of living increase. You know, the, the, the norm 10 years ago was probably a 3% increase for COLAs. It got down to be 2%, um, and I think now we're to the point where it's under 2%. Um, that's probably one of the biggest increases, and obviously that's the biggest amount that is within the budget um, is basically salaries. Can't think of anything else really off the top of my head, uh, but you know, again, a half a percent when it comes to those salaries, I mean, it, it does have a, it does have a substantial a substantial impact on the bottom line. So, but between the the, the two forty, that's part of the excess capacity, the the interest that you're talking about potentially on. For the course of the year for the dpw facility theoretically there really isn't a whole lot of deficit if you want to start using one-time revenue well no, i'm just you're well, right yeah I, I guess if you're making a statement then i'll agree but I, i'm saying I, I put caution there because you're using one-time revenues mm -hmm. to balance out a budget it's like using reserves and when those revenues dry up you're in a bigger hole for the next fiscal year
any other, can I be mouth? If you guys have any questions, just because you're there, you can freely ask. Paul, do you have anything else you want? I, I'm done with my presentation. Okay, so I, you gave I have me ten minutes. So I, I just had a couple of comments, and it's more to educate everybody here because uh, based on a couple of discussions as far back as last year, but uh, maybe beyond that, there's a, a task force out there looking at what can we do about the, the ceiling, the Prop Two and a Half ceiling, which, according to Paul, we're probably okay till 2023. And maybe even beyond that, if we get some growth in in, in our tax base, uh, I, I'm going to be take the pessimistic side here. But my sense is that that we're not moving quickly on that with anything other than can some ideas of controlling expenses, uh, looking for marginal revenue that's developing idle or unused properties in town. And other things, and Maria, I'm looking at you because I know you're involved in that. But as I see each one of those things, there, you know, a, a year's worth of growth, if I'm right, two and a, two and a half percent of our budget is somewhere around 1.5 million dollars, Paul, something like that. Yeah, uh, probably a little bit more. It's a little bit greater than a 60 million dollar budget. Okay, so you know, so to continue to be able to grow, we need to uh, even at the two, just two and a half percent. We need to be able to increase, have additional million and a half dollars in, in revenue, give or, give or take. And, and most of the things we look at for developments are in the thirty-five, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollar. Even if they're the hundred thousand dollar range, it's a far cry from the million and a half dollars we need year over year. And most of those would be a one-time revenue increase of even if it's a hundred thousand dollars. And so, you know, they're clearly needs to be some fundamental change in our in our revenue package long term. The other comment I'll make is that that because I've been a proponent of seeking relief from Prop two and a half at a state level, at least at the seeking relief from the twenty five dollar levy limit, which was established in as Paul reminds me in nineteen eighty three, uh, when back when nobody had ever envisioned houses getting to you know, or, or taxes getting up to $25. We had a meeting, I think it was last week, with uh, the, there's uh, select board representatives from several of the towns in Hampton and, and Hampton County with our state senator, Eric Lesser, and brought this topic up. And uh, I was pretty disappointed that there didn't seem to be anybody else who was willing to go that direction of looking for legislative a relief. In fact, even one of the other towns represented there who's pressing their $25 limit said, just assume we stop stop raising taxes and stop spending rather than go, go for legislative relief. And so I walked away from there, and I don't know if some other people there, Billy, were there, and other, other folks were there, whether, Stephen, you got the same, same impression that with legislative relief for the $25 cap it's going to be a very, very long haul, and if we want to do it, we've got to pretty much do it on our own and start early, because it's going to take a while. Stephen, uh, I, I think it's Bill and Mark's point. Um, you know, everyone agrees that keeping that two and a half percent per year limit on the increase in taxes is something we want to keep. I think everybody agrees with that. We've been able to live with it, live within that. Uh, we've even done last year, and hopefully this year we'll even do a little better than that. And we have not needed to use reserves <coughs> to fund recurring expenses. Uh, and we've been able to maintain our obligations for things like capital and OPEB. Um, and, and I think we've been able to, you know, maintain level services, but I think we've also been able to um, enhance, if not, you know, expand services for really the same, the same amount of, of uh, resource <coughs> commitment. Uh, and I think we've actually ended up find, finding some savings from doing those changes. But I think the big thing with the levy ceiling is, um, I think it, 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 municipalities should have the option as to whether this is something, whether or not this is something they want to do. Uh, there are towns who may not offer a full complement of services, who may just decide, you know, we're gonna, we're not going to go over the cap because we don't feel like we need to offer these services, and we don't believe our schools are tied to our pro the quality of our schools impact our property values or something like that. Whereas 
community like Longmeadow may say, you know what, no, we do think we need to um, have the flexibility to go over that cap because our the, the quality of our schools and the quality of our infrastructure is essential to maintaining our property values so we don't, it doesn't make matters even worse. Uh, and that's, I think, the message that we did leave with the legislature, with, a, with Senator Lesser, and I think as we look at this, it's going to be, um, is there going to is there a possibility for a local option for this and leave it up to the voters of Longmeadow to decide whether or not they want to do it? Mm -hmm. I guess I, I have two questions. I, you know, one would be, how are our property values in comparison to other towns? I mean, would you say that people buying properties are willing to pay more to live in our town compared to, you know, Agawam or Holyoke? Or, you know, I mean, is I, it is do we see an increase? that's proportionately larger than other communities that are near us who offer uh, a less um, competitive school system? And it would be one question. I guess the other question is just, you probably can get them both like this, Paul. You know, but the other question is, you know, as interest rates grow up, how will that will affect our uh, property values? Will that change them in a, in a positive direction? Can I take a stab at the first one? Go ahead. So, uh, Tom, with regard to the first question, he, he can handle the interest rate question. That's above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> with regard to the question about uh, how we compare to other dis other air, um, communities, yeah. um, a couple of things. I think when you look at, uh, you know, the uh, MMA puts out their annual um, data book on all municipalities. And when you look at um, our data, we are 33rd in per capita income, which is high. Like 33rd from the top, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably the highest in, in Western Mass. Um, we are 202nd in equalized value, property values, equalized value per capita. And the reason why I think that's significant in terms of ability to pay is that when you look at, you know, when the lists come out of top places to live in Massachusetts or top school districts in Massachusetts, and you look at the 20 towns, many of them are east of us. And I think if you look at if you looked at each of those towns and went to that same data book, those two numbers, income per capita and equalized value per capita, are much closer together. Uh, and to me, that's significant in terms of um, that's a good sign, I guess. I, I take that as a good sign uh, of Longmeadow's ability to sustain itself, but for this this limit um, that's in the this you know going on forty year old law that again I think was somewhat of an arbitrary number. Um, and the other thing is, I think when you compare us to those other dis those other towns, our amount of taxes people pay is much less in terms of like their annual bill is far lower. And so I think people get a pretty good bang for their buck um, for the quality of services that they get out here. Um, yes, the rate is the highest in the Commonwealth, but the actual tax bill is significantly low lower than a lot of comparable communities. Um, as far as comparable communities in Western Mass, it's it's a bit. It's a little more challenging to do that. I mean, we could look at East Longmeadow. I think their tax rate is in the twenties as well. Um, Granby was one of the communities that mentioned it. So I think we're not. We're certainly not alone in that out here. Mm -hmm. And then the interest rates. Uh, rising interest rates, I think, would have a negative impact on valuations. Yeah. Um, you know, again, if you have a thousand dollars to spend on a mortgage and you're paying more in interest, it, you know, you have a little less in principal that you can afford. So I would think that has would have a negative effect. I think what the positive effect is that. The economy overall still is strong overall more people are working so I think that is is the beneficial part at this point in time that's working in our favor um, you know whether wages are increasing by those uh, by higher amounts I, I'm not I'm not familiar with but again the economy as a whole is doing fairly well still so but interest rates would have a negative impact um, mortgage interest rates so w one of the potential remedies and again we've got three years for our tax levy limit is to move things out of the tax base into fees <coughs> and you know prior to last year's federal tax law I was a big proponent to say I'd much rather pay for things in taxes because their local taxes are deductible and, and, and fees aren't but to the extent that there's a, a limitation in your tax deductions from local taxes which we're all going to find out come April 15th next year, you know, the question is, Paul, should we start looking at potential things to pull out of the tax base? I mean, I see, for example, you know, uh, recycling, which is our, our trash trash collection. You know, that's 400 and 
four hundred fifty thousand dollars, something like that, a year. Or it actually goes to nine hundred thousand. Oh, because that's yeah, mine's just the hauling. There's also the disposal, right? Right. So, I mean, that's that almost get moving that into a fee takes literally takes you back into uh, another year of, of of growth, right? Right. I, I think you would want to start looking at those on a on a, a gradual impact basis. Um, you know, the storm water fee, FY19, was the first year. Um, we projected to raise $200,000 in storm water fees. Um, I've only projected that amount to go up to $230,000, but that also is subsidized pretty heavily by the general fund to the tune of, uh, you know, close to another half a million dollars. So, again, you may want to look at those and, and you know, make a decision. How much of these enterprise funds do you want to be subsidized by tax revenues, and how much do you want to have it funded by, by, um, by the user fee? And if you make that policy decision, you could move. If and if it is to move to a lesser amount out of the tax, the tax levy. I mean, you could start making some of those moves to ease the pain a little bit and prolong that proposition two and a half kind of uh, target date. I mean, the recognition is that it doesn't change the amount of money that. The homeowners and residents of Long Meadow pay. It just moves it out of this tax base to, to avoid the arbitrary $25 cap. Well, the, it increases the amount they're going to pay. Yeah, that doesn't we're, increase we're, the taxes. Yeah, but it increases I mean, the bottom line. You know, call it call it straight. Well, it, it continues to yeah, increase it at 2.5%. Yeah, percent. They're, which they're going to pay an additional. They're going to. Right. They're not going to pay it on a tax base. They're going to pay it out of their pocketbook, and right. including the tax bill. Tax bill is not well, going that's down. My intent to say is it wouldn't change the amount that they pay based on whether it's in the tax base or out of the tax base because yeah. they're going to pay for it one way or the other. Okay, it's not the way it came across. I apologize. Okay. okay. Uh, I, I guess I just asked for any comments or suggestions from others on <clears throat> where do we go from here. Clearly, the upcoming fiscal year, the 2020 budget that we're going to be preparing is going to come through the way it's. We've done it in the past, and, and I think Paul, you were correct. And you know, I kind of use this as the Paul Pasturzik, like the sky is falling meeting because we have this, this this every year, and the sky doesn't doesn't fall because something turns around. But I think long term, we still need to come up with potential direction on on how we're going to res resolve this issue. And it, and you know, 2023 seems like it's forever off there. But I think Tom, you're right that you know a, a, a one or two or three percent increase in in, in interest rates could significantly impact housing values in this town, and it doesn't take much but a 1% downturn. And you know, you, you, you showed what that a 1% uptick in our housing values moves it out two years. My presumption is a 1% 1, 1 downtick in housing values you know, accelerate. accelerates it at two years. And so we've got to get to the point where we're prepared to deal with this. Yeah, Mark, I would like to say that your point about looking at some of these costs and moving them to a fee instead of a tax thing um, is worth considering a little more just because when we look at when a crisis happens and for us a crisis would be you know having to you know stop certain services uh, change the way we look at um, the budget for this school department and so forth that would be a crisis and so those kinds of things happen when there's a lot of small mistakes that accumulate over a period of time. And I think, you know, your background of safety, you probably know about risk management, how you have to catch those things. And so <clears throat> there might be small decisions we can make now, you know, like the, uh, you know, the rainwater assessment, you know, uh, and, and maybe looking at how we're dealing with uh, recycling. That can begin to shift some of these things so we don't have a catastrophe down the line. And I. I, you know, I appreciate your uh, idea. You know, that it was something that we haven't really talked about. Um, I know it may not be popular, but you know, if we have a catastrophe in five years from now, that's certainly not going to be popular, either. <laughs> Richard, yeah, I think it's interesting we have this talk about cas catastrophes and this, that, and the other, but we we haven't put the equation in. Uh, taxpayers are going to pay more money. You pay it in fees, or you're going to pay it in taxes. We haven't. We've not. There's not been a single discussion at this board or at any of the meetings that I've heard of, of, of talking about selectively reducing services. What services could we actually do away with, with a vote, referendum vote, or whatever? 
I think any discussion along this line without that discussion is what malfeasance, I, I don't know how you explain, I mean, it's certainly not good management. I mean, I can't imagine, I mean, you guys are looking at the golden goose is gonna lay an egg and you're not looking at cutting back anything. You're just looking for ways to fund further expansion of programs. And I, I can't imagine any municipal government that has that view without uh, looking at cutting services and saying, what is the impact if we do cut this service? Because we're gonna price people out of our community. We're already pricing people out of our community. We don't have senior housing. And what we have is full or so expensive that most seniors can't afford it. And we haven't done anything on, on that outreach. Uh, that alone is a revenue generating thing. If we developed the Watertown property and had 700 condos or 400 or 300 condos, that could loosen up 300 homes in our community that would be adaptive reuse of homes and take the values up as a recondition. The seniors are not gonna recondition as long as they live there. We know that. They're not gonna put any more money into the homes. They're living their tax base. They don't wanna change anything. So I, I don't know the discussions. I, 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 I'm a little biased because the only discussion I hear is let's, let's get the golden goose to lay a bigger golden egg instead of reducing it down and going to a platinum egg. So I, I don't know where we're gonna go. I, I'm, not, I'm not impressed with our direction because my revenue's not going up and yet you're telling me I'm gonna pay more for the services in this town. And I'm not the only citizen in this town <clears throat> that has a fixed income base. So, so Richard, I, I, I appreciate your comments. I think one of the things we, I struggle with is, you know, where do we cut and how do we decide? When we do a, <coughs> a, a survey, and we did, did a survey of people, you know, what we get back is, we like the services we have. I mean, you know, don't cut my police protection, don't cut my fire protection, don't cut back on the schools because the schools are what makes us what we are. You know, and frankly, we don't buy enough pens and pencils. Of the rest of the budget's not big enough to to make a big difference. And so, the what you're talking about is making a a significant shift in the in, in the level of services in Long Meadow ends up making a a shift in the, what I'll call the quality of life to people in Longmeadow, who the residents then have to decide, is that what they're willing to get into? I mean, you know, some of the same people, and I don't wanna be overly critical here, who complained about, you know, fixed revenue, fixed income, and, you know, don't raise my taxes, are the people who voted to go out and spend millions of dollars on a, on a new adult center, which is gonna raise their taxes, you know, and, and there's no doubt it's going to raise their taxes. And I'm not saying that we don't need it, and I'm not saying it wasn't a good idea. So I think people selectively choose to get the services they want and decide what they're willing to pay for. The problem is it's not a, this isn't a cafeteria system in town. You can't say, well, I don't have any kids in school. I'm not paying for the schools. I only want to pay for the adult center, and I only want to pay for the, the DPW and fire. You're, you know, once you live in town, you you, you got to take the whole menu, and and that's that's the that's the crisis that that we're in. Is that I agree? It'd be nice to say let's cut back, and I'm willing to take a look at where we cut back. But I got to tell you, I'd much rather take a, a different approach, which is let's go find some massive source of new revenue. For example, you know, should the town be in the electric business? Holyoke does power. And, Power and water. I mean, Long Meadow's never done it. We're certainly not qualified to do it now. We're not trained to do it now. But I mean, that's really outside there where not only does the town get revenue, massive revenue, but in theory, the residents all get cheaper power. You know, if the town wants to take over and have its own utility system. I mean, that's way outside the box, but it's, it's, it's a long term, and, and you know, that's probably way out there that we're not going to go into this, our own electric utility system. But there's got to be significant revenue that we haven't looked at and 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 I look to other cities and towns in Massachusetts who are doing some of the things that we're not okay. doing but we're not going to we're not going to look to that vision if the only rhetoric we have is increasing our tax base and taking our levy limit up that's my problem yeah I agree with you but we're not out of, outside the box but, but we're inside had, the box if we had 10 million dollars of revenue from some other source our tax bills would drop by 10 million dollars yeah, Today. that's well, good. So, okay. Go I just want to clarify something. Uh, you know, 
Um, and, and Rich, you know that I mean we have easily a half a dozen initiatives underway to regionalize, to try and find more cost-effective ways of doing things. I mean, we talk about this stuff at the select board, you know, almost on a weekly basis. I think that the conversation tonight is about this is what the this is what we think the size of the pie is going to be for FY20. How we slice it. Um, is the next step in the process, but I mean, I, I, your point is well taken, and we, you know, all of the departments feel the pressure to um, find efficiencies, uh, you know, um, make sure that we are finding different ways of doing things. If there are new technologies out there, I mean, this is an ongoing daily um, effort for us, and so there are some things out there on the horizon. I mean, they take a while to to come to fruition, but there are certainly things we are pushing. Uh, that we think will um, benefit the town financially in the relatively near future, but they sometimes they take a little while. And I think, t yeah, the, I mean, the point is, um, if there was great, easy, easily accessible revenue sources, we would have already accessed them by now. And I think that that's one of the things. Again, the message to the legislature um, is, has tradition has been, at least from my point of view, there needs there should be more local options for revenue. Um, but I, I, I just, you know, for the purposes of tonight, we're talking about here's the size of the pie, and then, like I said, we're going to go forward and figure out how we can best allocate our resources. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, just to add to the legislature discussion, and I have no idea how this works, but is it possible to think of something like a ballot initiative where it's voted on at the state level for local funding? So local can, control over how yeah, it's funded? Let, let me kind of give you the background, Karen, if I, a little bit. Is that that... You know, we thought that you could go through uh, either a, uh, a, a local option system, which Stephen talked about, or a home rule type of petition to the, to the legislature. But it it's appears, and it, that's all it is, it appears to me is that, you know, legislators, legislators would still have to go on record as having voted for something. And so the, you know, it, potentially we can get our local legislators to, to help back this, but you know, it it it'd be a challenge. I think this the process would clearly be something in Longmeadow at a town meeting that would then go to a, a referendum vote, and the citizens of Longmeadow could then we could then take that vote to the legislature and say the citizens of Longmeadow have have asked that we you know petition the legislature for a home rule petition that allows us to go beyond the 25. I mean, that's it's got to be something like that. But we can't do it without something from the legislature that, that authorizes it to happen. And again, whether it's a, a, a wholesale exemption for all the cities and towns, or a local exemption, or whatever it is, Maria, you want to add? But the way you described it, it's actually very interesting. A ballot initiative to look at the different way that we're funding, whether it's the schools or the towns. Mm -hmm. So I think that's worth looking at, because we keep saying we need changes in that. And sometimes it does take ballot initiatives to really make a change mm -hmm. in the way things are being funded locally. Nothing mm -hmm. further on that. Mm -hmm. No. I don't know. Paul. Mm -hmm. Years ago, there was an override that failed, and I was on the school committee at the time, and the superintendent <laughs> took a wedge approach to what would needed to be cut. So in the center were students, for example. And if you look at a wedge, that was the least amount that was going to get cut but affected the students, so to speak. So then they went down to like things like maintenance and so forth, and as the wedge got bigger, those percentages got bigger on the outside, but those all were also smaller areas. So some of the discussion we've had on the Finance Committee over the last six months or so is, what are the priorities in town? So we talk about this. You can, you can go build water tower property, raise a, a million bucks, you've got one year. So now it's not 2025, it's 2026. You go develop another piece of land, and get another million bucks in revenue, and you got one more year. But eventually, the years run out because the, the potential for the revenue starts to run out, that increase in revenue. So when we're doing the budget, we have the traditional, here's my conservative estimates, and it looks like there's a deficit. And there is. On paper, there's a deficit. And we're lucky if, it, you know, we're lucky that if, um, Health insurance, for example, doesn't go up, and all the, there's a, a bunch of different factors. And we've been lucky that we've had increases in certain areas that we weren't expecting over the years that have saved a budget. It, it really hasn't been the same number every year. It's just been different sources sometimes kick in. 
But as you go through the budget process, the question that I would ask is, what's the priority? Is continuing to increase OPEB, and we've had this discussion with Mr. Prosterzik at the Finance Committee, which gives a beneficial, not a very nominal beneficial side effect to the Moody's rating, is that a priority over delivering services, whether it's police, fire, teaching, whatever? Is anything else that you have in the budget, for example, increasing capital spending? And to the percentage that we keep, we continue to increase it. Or is it, you know, because we, we don't take, we don't look at a school project, a, a, a new senior center, we don't count that as increasing capital, so to speak. We, you know, that's over on the side here as a, as a, as a debt service, so to speak. <coughs> so when we look at what we're spending and how we're spending it, because it all equates, and I agree with Mr. Foster, that a dollar is a dollar no matter where it's coming out of to pay for your bill. So you can increase all the fees you want. If the average homeowner is paying 5,000 bucks a year now to live in Long Meadow and it goes to seven, whether it's in a user fee or in a tax base, it really doesn't matter to the homeowner. And as we continue to increase those property taxes, it does affect, it does affect property values to a degree that when someone's making a choice between our town and another town that's comparable and the property taxes are lower, they can either buy more house for a little bit less mortgage or just have a, less, a lower amount of mortgage. So, but what's the priority? What's the priority in the budget? Is it to, to continually increase OPEB, which we've had the discussion over the years of we're either the, one of the 10 smartest communities in the, in the Commonwealth or the 10 dumbest communities to continue to do it, but it's one or the other. It's, it's nominally helping us with our Moody's rate, and it's not a significant factor in it. Continuing to tax people and throw money into the Operational Stabilization Fund um, to appease Moody's again because they gave us a number of what they want to see us, is that a priority? And I'm not saying that we don't do it. The question is that when you're doing the budget, what's the priority? It can't all be a priority. Okay. There's got to be something that, that we okay. would, in, in two, listen, 2025 is going to come, and whether it's 2026 or 27, you know, if any of us are still on a board or committee, you know, or if we get out of town before then type of thing, but the town's going to face it at some point in time. And, and I think that's what the discussion on is that when you look at the budget, what's that wedge that if it were to happen tomorrow, because although the financial markets are doing well and the economy's doing well, all it takes is one little hiccup and you have a 2008 happens and you're not going down 1% in your property values. So 2025 becomes 2021. And that's what I would look at is, you know, as we continue to look at the budget is what's the priorities and what can be eliminated, lowered, or whatever it could be. The, the problem, Paul, is how do we establish what the priorities are and, and how do we come to a consensus amongst, you know, multiple diverse populations in town who have different interests, whether you're, you know, a, a family who's got three kids in the school or a, or a senior living on fixed income or anything in between. And, and that becomes... Be, becomes the, the, the problem we, that I see. I mean, and I'll, I'll quote some numbers because I remember eight years ago our, our capital spending was $800,000. And we had a lot of problems in town with buildings and streets and things like that. And now this year will be $1.9 I believe, in capital <coughs> spending. And you're right. We could, you know, easily cut back our capital spending to pay for operating expenses. But what will happen is Three years later, we'll find out that it was money poorly spent as the roads are falling apart and the you know roofs leaking our buildings and all that that other stuff. I mean, somehow that 1.9 million dollars in capital is spent, and, and I don't believe very much of it is wasted. And a lot of it's going into boilers right now of, of recent. So you're right. There's in, on, a, on a given year we can do something, but I haven't figured out how in this community. We set priorities other than to take the elected officials and say go to it because that's what you're elected to do and that's why most of us are here go ahead marie and then tom yeah and i think that the task force it's got finance it's got school it's got uh, community members as well as members select board that's one of the things we're looking at is the operational and just like the schools come to us and say well here's our tier one cuts tier two cuts that you've been doing historically. I think that's what the task force will be coming out and looking at and bringing a report back to all three committees and then it can, all of the committees can decide what they like and don't like of it. But the, I think the discussions are begun. Well, I, I agree with Marie. That it's the diversity of the discussions because from a pure business point, you know, um, first with MBA, 
is going to look at it one way, and then we need that diversity of uh, the committees, you know, to the school co school committee, the select board, finance committee, um, to come up with, you know, what are our, our true priorities, uh, because, you know, OPEP is something that, you know, it's, a, it's an agreement we've made with people who worked their perhaps entire career for the town, and, you know, that, you know, you can't think of it just like a business person, you know, and just say, well, that's, no way should we spend money on that? You know, other towns aren't. I mean, you know, we've made this commitment, and so, you know, we all have to, we have to, we all come at it from different angles. Yeah, I, I, I just want to make a quick comment about OPEB. So, nobody's saying we default on our, our liability for or our obligations to retirees to pay their other post-employee benefits, which is what <laughs> OPEP stands for. What we're saying is, should we do it, by, should we be taking money every year and putting it into a trust fund, or should we continue to pay for it out of our current operating expenses as we did for the last 20 or 30 years? And I think Paul Santinello's uh, reference to where one of the 10 smartest or dumbest communities is, there are very few communities who've created OPEB trust funds who take operating revenue and put it away into a trust fund as opposed to pay for it out of their current budgets, and, and in fact, the, the biggest cities and towns. No. There's a lot more now, I think, but yeah. but the yes, biggest every, cities every and town towns. Is yeah, but the biggest more cities more. and towns in this Commonwealth, whether it's Boston or Lowell or Lawrence or New Bedford or Worcester or Springfield, you know, I mean, we're nothing compared to where they are as a percentage of their overall budget that goes into OPEB. And you know, in my sense is there's going to be some. There's got to be some other kind of relief from OPEB. <laughs> Um, I just want to answer Paul's question about priorities. Um, first of an anecdote, when I was in public administration school, a professor once said that the most meaningless word in public administration is priority. <coughs> because if everything is a priority, by extension, nothing is a priority. Um, I can tell you that in the preparation of the budget, there are two clear priorities. Uh, don't use one-time revenue for recurring expenses, and uh, no operational overrides. And, you know, we talk about how we've been, use the word lucky, each year. Um, we were prepared to deliver a budget that used less than the Proposition 2 and a half levy cap um, with the state aid number that was, low, that was lower. <coughs> uh, and so we were able to avoid some service cuts, uh, but, it was, but we didn't increase spending on it. In fact, we had the opportunity, and we chose not to even after the fact. And so luck is only part of it. Um, and the thing is, is I would instead of using the word priority, I would suggest that the word we our operating uh, watchword is balance. How do we balance everything out so you provide a full slate of services to everyone in the community, um, and to keep that in in balance so one section of the community or one service that the town provides doesn't either grow or shrink disproportionately in any given year. And that's the thing I want to um, I commend Paul and, and Tom on is that um, they've done an excellent job in laying out how best to do that every year, which is why we've been able to maintain that balance. And like I said, um, last year, and I think this year, used less than our full 2.5% um, capacity. So I, I don't want it to be all doom and gloom. I think what Paul's laid out, if you look at the data in a, in a positive light, is that we are moving this in the right direction. And I think that, that, that both um, those two gentlemen, um, Superintendent O'Shea and the School Committee and Select Board, deserve a lot of credit for making um, good decisions to maintain that balance. And I think town meeting has agreed, because ultimately, Finance Committee can have a priority, School Committee can have a priority, Select Board can have a priority, but it's town meeting's priority that's going to end up getting the money. Uh, and I think that, like I said, we've had um, good success communicating with town meeting, explaining why we think we've covering those priorities and uh, maintain the balance. And one more comment, and then we'll go get ready for kickoff. Um, the overall priority is maintaining property values. And the thing that gets lost in all of this, is, in, in much of this, is how do, how do we maintain property values? And quality schools, a good senior center, the ability to provide first class uh, public safety and public work services, um, good streets, good shopping options, all of those things are components in what makes a community a desirable place to buy a house and either um, uh, age or raise a family. And 
when we look for that balance, is how do we balance out our, our suite of services to maintain property values by making sure we're touching all of those bases in some way. And so, this, and Mark, you've, I've heard you say this many times, it, the, the fundamental issue is it, it's a denominator issue. The, pro, the overall is that $2 billion number, that is the big number in all this discussion about the tax ceiling. And the decisions we make on our annual operating budget have a, have a direct impact on that number. And that's, so Paul Santanella, to answer your question, what's the priority? The priority is make sure we don't do damage to that number. So, you know, I think that this is, everything that's been said tonight has been basically accurate. And uh, to me, if I looked at this picture and this problem, it would be an all of the above strategy, right? You basically trade revenue with many of the things, including fees that have been discussed tonight. But if you didn't want to have to create priorities, quote unquote, you could basically, and, and not have people fight over it, not have the schools have their little fiefdom and, uh, and each department. You could basically do the equivalent of like a federal sequester where you basically made it simple and said, we're gonna drop everyone's budgets by a half percent and it's already gonna be commensurate, including like OPEB or capital planning. It's already commensurate with what everybody's getting and so everybody can buy into that in a political sense because everyone's hurting the same amount and everyone's respecting everyone else's doing the same thing. So it seems like the simplest way and maybe oh, something that we end up arriving at in the end. So maybe the task force can come up with all of these strategies but include that and bring it to you guys and see if that's a simply, the simplest way everyone can agree to move forward. Because it's obviously very important to move forward. Yeah. Even though it seems hopeless, we have to make the effort. I, I hope it doesn't look hopeless, Andrew. I, 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 th I think the, you know, my personal opinion is that, you know, across the board, three percent cuts or across the board, three percent is, is is a default way out, and it's not looking at what the real priorities are. And I've said this to every year when we do our budgets. You know, there may be departments that need a five percent increase, not a three percent increase or two and a half percent increase, and find out what really needs the money and real, where it really is. And I think we owe it to the citizens of Longmeadow to take a, a hard look and, and, you know, potentially do the politically inexpedient and say, no, we're, we're not going to just take, give everybody the, the two and a half percent cut the first year that we hit the ceiling, and a two and a half percent cut the second year we hit the ceiling, but we're going to do it preferentially so that we don't do damage to, I guess it's Stephen said, don't do damage to the denominator, which is the value of homes in town. But that's my personal opinion. All right. I think that that's, that's, that's a good place to oh. I'm sorry. Um, well, first, I want to mention the, the nice reference to the Red Sox with the do damage comment. I don't know if that was intentional <laughs> or not. But, um, so um, just to swing it back, the revenue side and, and maybe um, a hopeful sign is, you know, one of the things we look at on the school side is, is Chapter 78, which is one of the biggest, if not the largest, sources of revenue that, that the town receives. And so in FY19, the ultimate allocation was a lot higher than what we had originally projected. And so that, that turned out to be a great thing for all of us. Um, and I think I would just offer that there's a lot of attention at the state level around that Chapter 70 line item uh, and a growing sense that the school funding formula is outdated and needs updating, and I think the state addressed it in some small measure for FY19, and, and um, I think I anticipate that they may address it in a, in a greater way for FY20. I think that goes back to the conversations that we have with our, with our representatives and state senators as well. So I think that's something to keep our eyes on as well. How many years have we uh, not hit the full 2.5? Years. Yeah. I think there were six out of the last 36, Richard. I think it's. Uh, they're, they're, they're recent, aren't they? In the last three or four years, we haven't hit? Uh, no, they're not recent. We were slightly under in recent years. Yeah, but yeah, last yeah, year, when we really made the commitment, yeah. it went. Yeah. To a, it went from like 9,000, 10,000, 40,000 to 130 or something like that? Uh, FY19 is like $130,000. Before that, it was FY2016, which was $42,000. And before that, it's um, 1999, which was 277. Okay, so the select board made a commitment 
to our budget policies and all to not take the full levy limit. And, and you followed through and programmed everything. We also made a commitment three or four years ago to start supporting OPEB. And we started, we put in a very logical approach to a quarter percent per year. And we also decided six, seven, eight years ago to start supporting our capital program to more to the tune. I mean, we, we know the funding should be six, eight million dollars and we're putting in two. Uh, and I will never get to six or eight, but that's what you would need for a resource this large to maintain it at the standards employed across America, what we should be doing. So we have not only pushed forward on those programs, we've also held back on the levy limit. So we've been doing an awful lot in, in, in the process here to, to crank in savings. And I'm not quite sure where it's all been coming from, but there has been a concerted effort because we've, incrued, we've improved programs, we've made financial decisions for the future of our community, which we should be doing as a legislative branch, and you've also not taken the full tax levy. So I, I'm not sure where it is, but we are, we are heading in the right direction. I think Paul Santanel alluded to it earlier. Many years, it's different things. Right. Um, you know, last year again it was a state aid that was very helpful to us. Go back three or four years ago, we had low increases in health insurance. You know, we had zero three zero mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, and that saved a tremendous amount of, of, of et amount of money on these estimates. Um, we had a major influx of motor vehicle excise tax revenues five and seven years ago that have seemed to have leveled off. They took huge things, so it seems to be something a little bit different every year, but there usually is something that works to our advantage. I think as a former finance committee once said, we get the right answers for all the wrong reasons. But, but you've, also, you've also been <coughs> pushing new programs in for the, for the financial future of our community, though. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's in concerns. addition to lowering the tax rate, and I, it, it, I don't care if it's witchcraft or whatever it is, it, it, it really does look good. Now, of course, we've also had a fantastic bull market, and now it's starting to turn. Housing prices are apparently in the major markets are already starting to settle. So all these nice shares we've had may, may go down the wayside in the next three, but up to this point, we, if, if I was gonna grade what the community's doing, like Moody's doing and all, they're giving us good grades, because sure. we are doing good. And we're taking care of the long-range financial growth or, or, or future of our community as the board should be. There's always disagreement on what we're doing here, but still overall, in our collective wisdom, we're moving forward in a proper direction. Right. There's, I think there's been relatively few service cuts, if any. Right. Um, it's not going back years ago. Someone was asking me, um, you know, about leaf pickup. You know, that has, you know, that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. We had leaf pickup, and you know, she was asking me, don't, don't you guys have leaf pickup anymore? Yeah, it's been gone for a long time. We have a question. It's mm -hmm. fine. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to, to uh, bring up a subject that it's really for the town manager, um, the question. It, so it sounds like, from what Paul said, that the COLAs, like the, the town employees, have kind of really come to the table and helped solve the problem here in the last few years. The COLAs have come down a lot. Um, do we have anywhere to go with compensation? Is there any? like next steps on how to address, since it is a large portion of the budget, uh, how to address compensation going forward? Uh, it's a great question, Ed. Um, and it's the answer is um, a lot of different ways. It, there's no there's no broad brush approach to that. Um, there are, uh, it's really micro, it's really a micro approach to it, uh, really right down to each job. Um, the town, for a variety of reasons, has a lot of turnover. Uh, our HR department is kept very busy. And so we try and take the time to analyze each position. Is it benefited, is it not benefited? Um, when there's a chance to um, <coughs> unbenefit a position, we try and do that. Or if there's already um, benefits associated with the position but they're not fully at 40 hours, if we increase the hours, can we avoid the need for another benefited position someplace else? So these types of analyses happen, in fact, this, this, this very morning I, I had one of the, these discussions. Um, we also get fortunate sometimes with attrition. Uh, we've tried to um, hire people. Uh, like if someone retires after being here for 
30 years, their replacement is going to come in at a lower step. Um, and so we do try and push all of these. And, and I will say that um, a lot of the success in, in that uh, realm, and this is one thing, like, the, the, like when Paul talks about state aid being like a single big factor last year, each year these micro employment decisions and compensation decisions also um, help achieve the balance. But the flip side of that is it is getting increasingly difficult to find people to want to come do um, government work generally, municipal work specifically. And the community has pretty high expectations for its level of service, and it takes qualified human beings um, that are committed to their work to meet those expectations. So that's another balancing act. So it's um, making sure we're not pricing ourselves out of the market so we're not getting talented people, but at the same time making sure that we're not um, we're not just you know throwing money at people either. Um, and like I said, really the I think that uh, I'm sure uh, the superintendent would echo this. It's really the, the the managers in our departments that do an excellent job of helping us make those decisions. And so I, but that's like a that's like a day to day grind trying to figure all that out. So there's not there's not any one big strategy. It's it's basically continuing to attack it the way you have been. Yeah, and I think just being consistent with your with the approach. Mm -hmm. um, so when when a position comes up, department heads know the questions that Paul and I are going to ask, the, the approach we want to see taken. And then on the, and with collective bargaining, it's looking at what are other communities doing, what are the what are inflationary trends? Because if we just decide we're not gonna, we're going to give zeros, and other communities around us are giving twos, we're going to end up either at the JLMC for public safety, which is a joint labor management council, or in front of an arbitrator for non-public safety. And what those boards all do one central thing, and that is they look at what other towns are giving. And so we have to make sure we, we uh, guard our flank uh, so we're not spending money on attorneys mm -hmm. on top of all of that. So it, it's it's a lot more complicated than I think it seems on its face. But like I said, every, every time a position opens up or changes, we try and find a way to economize it. Anybody else have any other comments? I think we've probably exhausted our discussion this evening. No, seeing no other questions of, uh, you know, I guess formally, since this is a formal select board and school committee meeting, you can ask for a German school committee. I'm going to ask for a German a motion to adjourn the select board. So moved. Is there a second? Yeah. Motion is made and seconded. All in favor? Right. Make a motion to adjourn the school committee portion of the meeting. Second. Do we pause? And you have finance committee. Finance committee? Yes. All those in favor of the Meeting adjourned. Yep. Right. Make a motion to make a motion yeah. to approve. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One in every group. Yeah. Thanks all for coming, and remember yeah. elections yeah. next next week. Uh, but early voting has already begun, so if you find it uh, convenient to go vote, go vote this week at the Greenwood Center. Greenwood Center. Thank you. Good night. Right. All right.